Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about your colonial American ancestors. Um, after last night's episode of Who Do You Think You Are, lots of people have questions about um, the allegiance of their ancestors. Were they uh, loyalists or Tories, or were they patriots or revolutionaries? interesting um, little information about language before we dive into that presentation. Um, loyalists is the British name for those who remained loyal to the British crown during the American Revolution. Tories is what the uh, uh, revolutionaries called them. Revolutionaries is what the British called those who were rebelling and patriots is what they called themselves. And so interesting use of language there. However, a lot of us, especially those of us who uh, live here in the United States, of course get the story or the history of the American Revolution from our perspective. Um, oftentimes there's a phrase that the winners write the history um, and so sometimes it ends up skewed to that perspective a little bit. So I really uh, loved last night's episode of Who Do You Think You Are because it, it, it gave me this Canadian or British perspective of the, the American Revolution. And so today what we're going to talk about is just an overview of who the Loyalists were, how you might start to identify some of them in your tree, and then I'll just give you a couple of resources at the end about where you can go to learn more about your colonial American ancestors. So let's go ahead and dive in. We're gonna start uh, with a quote actually from the second president of the United States. Uh, right shortly after the revolution, he said, we're, we were about one third Tories and one third timid and one third true blue. Uh, I think that's really interesting that he identified the population that way, um, that one third timid, of course, meaning those fence sitters or those people who um, did not choose a side either way. A lot of times people don't in, um, in situations like that. They kind of wait to see which side's winning or they're not emotionally invested in the outcome one way or the other. And so really interesting there. But then I started thinking about, well, what does that mean? What do those numbers mean? And so I started digging into some of the numbers as far as population. And there's a lot of, um, there's still, even now, you know, a couple hundred years later, still some debate about some of those numbers. But I was able to put together uh, just some broad stroke numbers so that you have an, uh, an idea or you start to get a context for what we're talking about. So the total population of the American colonies at the time of the revolution was about two and a half million people. Just to kind of start to wrap your head around that. The loyalists or Tories um, a number anywhere from uh, 500,000 to 800,000 people. So that's the number of the total population that um, identified as loyalists um, to the British crown during the American Revolution. Here's kind of the interesting thing, though, that I discovered. About 80% of those who identified as loyalists remained in the United States after the Revolution. So they reconciled themselves to the new government and stayed in the United States. So just because your family stayed in the U.S. does not mean that they sided with the Patriots during the American Revolution. That's really important to understand. So a lot of times you have to go digging through the records to determine if they were um, actually a Patriot or a Loyalist. And there are records that, that will show. Sometimes those records are um, actually military, actual military records showing that they fought for one side or the other. Sometimes those records have to do with who they pledged allegiance to or who they financially supported. Um, and then of course, sometimes there will just be those people who, um, that one third timid, right, who may not show up in any record. We may never see anything that, that proves their allegiance one way or the other. But also on either side, we may not find records that prove allegiance. I just found it really interesting that 80% of them um, chose to remain in the United States after the revolution. I have to imagine that, um, that there was some real, um, some real conflict or some you know, uncomfortable things that happened. But a lot of people, a lot of families had people on both sides of the conflict as well, which is important to remember. And so sometimes the choice to stay was a choice of loyalty to the family not necessarily a, a loyalty to the government. Lots of different, I mean, 
we could postulate on several different reasons and probably as many reasons as there are people. So uh, specifically when we start talking about loyalist refugees, this is a little bit of a different picture then, right? Because you have a, you know about a half a million loyalists, 80% of them remain in the United States. That means only 20% of them left the United States. And some of them were forcibly, some of them were forced out um, and ended up in refugee camps and then ended up um, you know, in Canada. And the number of the Canadian refugees uh, loyalist refugees is estimated to be at about 60,000. Okay, so again, the numbers here are just to give you some kind of a perspective of, you know, when you're looking for your ancestors, where might you find them? Just as a point of interest, you'll know, you'll note um, 60,000 is not 20% of a half a million, right? So if only 60,000 ended up in Canada, where did the rest of the 20% that left the US go? Interestingly enough, um, about 13, between 13 and 15,000 people returned to Great Britain. Uh, of the rest, the remainder of that 20% that left the United States ended up um, in other British colonies, and a large chunk of them ended up actually in Florida, which was not part of the United States at the time. And so you end up with um, you end up with people kind of fleeing um, just outside of the boundaries of the U.S. as well as going all the way back to Great Britain. So um, that's kind of the the numbers the, to give you this perspective. We're going to talk specifically about these loyalist refugees for a few minutes. Um, here's kind of a, a way to determine if you have a loyalist refugee in your family tree. We'll look at it from the Canadian side as well as from the US side. The, the first thing is if you're tracing your family back to colonial times and you can't quite figure out how they arrived in Canada and you're in that time period that you might have a loyalist refugee in your family tree. Um, a little bit of a spoiler alert if you have not yet watched Who Do You Think You Are from last night? That was the question that led the McAdams sisters um, into Canada was they wanted to know how their family ended up in Canada. That was the question that spurred that particular research for them. And so, you know, if you're looking through your history and you're tracing back and tracing back in Canada, and then you get to colonial times and you can't figure out how they arrived, they might have come in from the United States as refugees at that time period. Looking at it from the United States side of things, um, the largest number of loyalists were in these states, New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And so if you have family members um, that you have traced, you know, not everybody traces their ancestry back, some trace their ancestry down, right? So you find, you pick a relative and you're, or an ancestor and you trace their descendants. And so if you have family members, aunts, uncles, cousins, to whatever degree, and you've got them living in these locations, and then all of a sudden you lose them after the American Revolution, you know, you can't find them in any more records after that, maybe they were loyalists who became refugees and uh, went up into Canada or went to some of those other locations. So that's just uh, a gauge to kind of start to determine if you have loyalist refugees in your family tree. So um, then there is a specific, um, a specific name given to some of those refugees. Not all of them were awarded this title. Um, this is actually a British honorary title, a United Empire Loyalist. It's a British honorific. And um, they are specifically American loyalists who resettled in British North America uh, during or after the American Revolution. And um, most of them that received this title settled in what was Quebec and now is uh, and part of what is now modern Ontario. And as part of this title that they received, they also received a land grant of 200 acres per person. That is probably going to be the single best record that you're going to find to determine whether or not your ancestor or family member was a loyalist. And so let me just show you um, a couple of places where you can go to uh, access this information. The first place is, of course, going to be on Ancestry.com. If you go to uh, the card catalog, and hopefully you're all familiar with the card catalog, you're going to find it as the bottom option on the search menu. 
It's going to show you all of the databases on Ancestry.com. Over here, I'm going to type in loyalist and hit search, and it's going to show me that there are 10 databases that contain information about loyalists. Okay, And some of these, most of these actually are books that have been published. And so I would strongly encourage you to explore at least some of the titles of some of these books. Maybe check out the indexes or the tables of contents for them. So you'll see things if I scroll down here, um, you know, an old Newport loyalist, um, a partial list of the descendants of Reverend George Gilmore, who was a loyalist, um, the diary of Thomas Vernon, a loyalist banished from Newport, Rhode Island by the uh, General Assembly in 1776. I mean, like this is good stuff. These are books that are going to help you, whether your ancestor is mentioned or not, really understand the Loyalist cause and some of the things that they went through. Um, Kingston and the Loyalists of the Spring Fleet of 80, 1783, with reminiscences. I love that this is the title of this book, right? With reminiscences of early days in Connecticut, a narrative to which is appended a diary written by Sarah Frost on her voyage to St. John, New Brunswick, with the Loyalists, <coughs> excuse me, of 1783. I love that that's the title of this book, right? Um, but I have read through this book. Um, not, I haven't read all of it, but I have um, kind of skimmed through it and read passages. Fascinating, fascinating information. Again, even if your ancestor is not mentioned in some of these narratives or some of these books, to be able to read about the experience of some of them gives you context and gives you information about some of the things that your ancestors may have gone through. A couple of other books of uh, information about descendants of loyalists that have been uh, researched. And then let me just talk about two of these databases in, in particular. This one is New York Sales of Loyalist Land from 1762 to 1830. Um, in the state of New York, uh, the, their government started passing laws that required that the land be sold out from under some of these loyalist families and um, to, to help pay for the revolution. Uh, the revolution, uh, even though it <clears throat> ended after a while, then we see the War of 1812 flare up um, years later. And so there's still, you know, there is a big cost to war, not just the the cost of human life and suffering, um, there's a huge financial cost and that burden is sometimes borne for decades after the war has ended. And so you see this land sometimes being sold all the way up until 1830 out from under these people who profess loyalty to the British crown. And so in New York, if your family happens to live in New York, not only does this, um, the sales list who who owned the land originally as well as who obtained it. So if they're listed here, as someone who lost land, that's a good clue that they were in fact a loyalist. Now this particular database um, is, if I come over here, scroll down here to this database description, this came out of the New York State Archives, um, actually from the, the state lands um, department. And I encourage you to read the database description just to get some additional information. It talks about the specific counties included and um, a couple of uh, additional pieces of information. You can browse it over here. We've talked about browsing before. Browsing just means you can go directly to a specific image or set of images, or you can search the database just like you would any other database. You're going to see here, it gives the name of the loyalist. Uh, it gives the name of the person who bought the land. It gives the date that that, uh, that occurred. Always, always, always remember to click on the image itself to get to the specific record because it sometimes has additional information. And so here we see <clears throat> that Nathan Smith has made application for this forfeited land. And you can see that there are three pages uh, for this particular record. That, sec that first page is where the record, the link is going to take you, okay? but it is just a cover sheet. That second page is where you're going to have the information about the specific land, when it occurred, um, you know, exactly what the circumstances are. It, it might give boundaries of the land so that you can find it on a current map today. So lots of really great information. Make sure you view all the images in the set when you get to a particular record in that collection. Really, really great. I'm going to, shouldn't have gone back. I should have just gone back to the record. Really, really great information um, in this collection. If you have family that were loyalists in the state of New York, 
that lost their land. The second collection I want to point out here, and this is the big one, this is the Can Canadian Loyalist Claims from 1776 to 1835. If you come in here, it's a fairly large collection. Again, be sure to read the database description. These particular records actually came out of the National Archives in England. Um, there it's called American Loyalist Claims. We call it Can Canada Loyalist Claims. A um, little bit of a difference in the naming of that particular, uh, this particular set of records. But it gives really detailed information here um, about what you're going to find in these records um, and how to search these records. And so when you come in here, it's going to allow you to just um, find some additional information. Uh, lots of different kinds of records, okay? So be aware that your ancestor may be listed multiple times in this collection. Make sure you catch all of those, okay? So we have correspondence, we have accounts of losses, we have minutes, we have memorials, we have evidence that's presented. Lot, again, lots of different kinds of records that might give you additional insight into your particular um, ancestor's life. And so let's just look at a couple of these for um, our friend Austin Smith here. His name is spelled a couple of different ways. And so um, again, make sure you account for the spelling differences. Okay. Also, make sure you always check, um, usually these particular records, the minutes are just one page, but always just double check those additional pages to make sure you're not missing additional information. Okay, So we have, um, we have minutes, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, oh, accounts of losses, minutes, memorials. Again, if we come here, always make sure you check that particular image realize that some of these, I mean, like, look at this image, right? The image is not the cleanest or prettiest image. Um, even the stuff that's that's typewritten um, has a little bit of some of that old um, English uh, typeset. So make sure that you understand those, you know, things like the, the S looks like an F, um, the C looks like an ampersand, you know, make sure you're, you, you understand some of those things, but once you do, then you can start to read some of these documents. So this is the Memorial of Austin Smith, late of the County of Orange, province of New York, yeoman, but now of Annapolis County, province of Nova Scotia, humbly showeth. And then there's this information about this memorial, the consequences of his loyalty, what happened to him. Um, exactly what happened to him during the war, really detailed account of that, and um, almost sometimes to the point, I've read a few of these, sometimes just to the point of just heartbreaking, um, war is not pretty, and so sometimes you see some of the things that are done to these men um, in their, you know, both as they are fighting and then once they have become refugees and, um, and fled. There's just some really heartbreaking circumstances that they endure. And some of these men were, you know, very prosperous. Some of these men were just poor farmers, like all walks of life, all religions, all circumstances. Some of them are people who helped settle the colonies originally. Some of them are people who had only been in the colonies from Great Britain for a couple of years before the revolution broke out it, there is no um, there is no consistency like it affected everyone regardless of their circumstances regardless of their their background and so then you read through um, some of these um, memorials in particular are they're just really really detailed um, about how the war affected them personally um, as they're making some of these applications or claims to um, to look for land and, and settlement in Canada. So uh, make sure you read through again, make sure you always check multiple pages, read through those. And very often like this one we just looked at for Austin Smith, you're going to see, you'll know it's your person because you'll see things like an occupation, the county that they lived in in the United States, and then the county that they were removed to in Canada. And you'll have to connect the dots and sometimes it will take multiple records in order to connect the dots. Um, but, you know, collect all those records and start to make sure that you've got the right person and you'll see some really amazing stories start to emerge. So again, you're going to find that in the Ancestry.com card catalog. Type loyalist into the title field. Those Canadian loyalist claims are going to be the very first thing that come up. Now, there are some additional records about loyalists that you can find. If you plural make this word plural loyalists, you'll see there's another set of 36 or so uh, records that come up. 
Some of these are actually um, specific lists. And I just want to point out another couple here. We have um, a couple of volumes, or actually I think three volumes, of Loyalists in the Southern Campaign of the Revolutionary War. So we have specific lists um, in a published book here of some of the... Um, units that the Loyalists fought in. And so you can even just see in the table of contents here, South Carolina Royalists, the King's Rangers. If you've been watching the TV show Turn at all, you should be familiar with the King's Rangers. Um, Camden, South Carolina Militia, Colton County, South Carolina Militia, right? You're going to just start to see some of these groups of of loyalists and so you can click through to any one of those and again this is a book so you're going to want to read it a little bit like a book sometimes it helps to start at the beginning but if you want to just jump to a particular um, unit of the military you'll see names listed there of the people who were serving in that particular unit and again these are loyalists or tories um, that were fighting against the revolutionaries or the patriots. And so you can start to see if you know your family lived in a particular county or particular location um, in the South, uh, or um, you know what unit they belong to, you can jump directly to that. Lots and lots. There's also lists of refugees and information about refugee hospitals, as well as burials included in some of these books uh, for for some of these. Now this is volume one. I mentioned there are several volumes you're going to see here. Um, volume two and volume three for those loyalists in the southern campaign of the Revolutionary War. You're also going to see lists for the loyalists that ended up in Ontario, uh, loyalists in land settlements in Nova Scotia, um, biographical sketches of loyalists in the American Revolution. These are typically going to be those who are more prominent, uh, were more prominent in the colonies and chose, uh, chose loyalty to the British crown. And so there's biographical sketches of them. There are a couple of volumes of that as well. Uh, old United Empire loyalist lists, Southern loyalists in the Civil War, or oh, that was so, Civil War. Um, keep going here. Loyalists in North Carolina during the Revolutionary War. New Jersey volunteers are, are loyalists in the Revolutionary War. Um, there's that volume two of those biographical sketches. We've got loyalists in Massachusetts. And then this book in particular, I just want to point out as well. Um, once you've identified that your family member were loyalists, if you determine that they ended up in Canada, this book is excellent. It is Pioneer Life Among the Loyalists in Upper Canada. So it's really about how they settled that area, how they um, rebuilt their lives, and how they contributed to um, to helping to shape Canada into what we know it as today. Um, this is another book that I have read um, large chunks of, and it just really um, is educational and instructive about the experience that these people went through. So again, even if your specific ancestor is not mentioned, um, the historical reference, the frame of reference, is really useful to helping understand what some of them went through. Okay, um, so those are some of those. Um, remember, type in loyalist or loyalists in the title of the card catalog in order to discover all of the titles that are um, that pertain to these. And then finally, the other thing that you might want to type in is Tory. There are only a few titles um, that pertain to that, but they might also, again, just be further instructive. In particular, this one, the narrative of Colonel David Fanning. He was a colonel um, for the for the Loyalists in the Revolutionary War, and he gives a really detailed account of what he experienced as a colonel for the British in the American Revolution. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of us come from, um, well, obviously not all of us, but a lot of us are here in the United States, and the history that we have, have heard has been from the American or the United States point of view. And so it has been really instructive to me over the last week and a half as I've been preparing for this presentation to read some of this history from the loyalist perspective and um, to understand the things that they went through and the reasons why they made the choices that they made. And some of them were equally as passionate about their 
perspective as the revolutionaries were about their perspective. And that's um, sometimes difficult to reconcile when you can see both points of view so very clearly. Um, sometimes we avoid other people's points of view because we don't want it to cloud or diminish our own. And it's, like I said, really instructive for me anyway to have read both points of view now um, about this particular conflict. Uh, so if you have family on both sides, useful to understand both perspectives. Okay, last resource that I want to share with you before we wrap up. There is um, a United Empire Loyalists Association of Canada. And so um, if you're familiar, let me just kind of uh, kind of couch this in something that some of you might be more familiar with. If you're familiar with the Daughters of the American Revolution or the Sons of the American Revolution, if you have an ancestor who was a patriot, you can join one of those organizations. <coughs> but you have to prove their loyalty to the <clears throat> cause of the revolutionaries or the patriots. Um, this is kind of a similar type of idea, um, which is that if you can prove that your family were loyalists or um, you can become part of this, okay? And so they also have a lot of resources. So you don't have to join the DAR or the SAR in order to access their resources and to determine if your ancestor was a patriot. You don't have to join this association necessarily in order to determine if your ancestor was a loyalist. They do have publications, um, some databases here on their website that you can access. So if you can't read that, um, URL on your screen. Let me just read it to you. It's UEL, United Empire Loyalists uh, AC, Association of Canada. So UELAC.org will take you to their website. Spend some time exploring that, understanding a little bit more about um, what they have available to you. Uh, interesting statistic from their particular website. It says that their, estimate, uh, their estimation is that one in 10 Canadians has a loyalist ancestor. And so uh, for those of our Canadian friends who are listening and watching, uh, one in 10 of you, um, according to UEL Association, has a loyalist ancestor who uh, originally lived in the American colonies before heading up to Canada. Also, if you live in Australia or New Zealand or Great Britain, it's very possible that you also could have loyalist ancestors. So be sure to check out their website. Lots of really excellent resources available there for discovering those ancestors. Hope this was useful information. If you want to dig into uh, more into loyalists and um, their perspective on the Revolutionary War, if you want to discover if your ancestor was a, was a loyalist, please be sure to check out the resources available in the card catalog. Um, dig through your family tree, see who was living where during the Revolutionary War, uh, and you might discover some real surprises. If you do, please leave a comment on YouTube. If you, if you discover that you have a loyalist ancestor that you did not know before now, I would love to hear about it. So please, please, please leave a comment uh, on this video once we get it uploaded to YouTube and uh, share what you have discovered. That's all I have prepared for you today. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.